to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the New World Order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. I am so sorry. I um, did not mean to hit the button to start the program yet, but I did hit it and forgot to turn the microphone off while the uh, introduction was playing. So my dogs, or at least one of my dogs, were barking in the background. And for that, I am truly sorry. And for any noise you may have heard from me moving around, I'm sorry for that as well. Tonight, we are having our annual um, program. Normally, I play my um, testimony from a different time because I've given, I've shared my testimony so many times. I've got just literally a plethora of recordings that I could use for my testimony but instead for tonight's remnant report live what i decided to do was to just share my testimony um live like to share it all over again i um i share my testimony here on the remnant report uh once a year usually and so i just decided that instead of playing the thing that I normally play that's a pre-recorded version of my testimony. I am just going to share my testimony with you all live. Sorry, I am trying my best to get something pulled up here. It shouldn't take but literally two seconds. Well, that's a little more than two seconds right now. But the good news is I am done. Just wanted to get that up on the screen and now we can start the program. I wish I would have brought some tissues in here because I don't know if I'm getting a summer cold or if it's all the pollen that's got my allergies going nuts, but my nose has been running and my eyes have been watering all day. But I entitled tonight's episode, uh, Death Dealer Comes Face to Face with Jesus. And the reason for that is because that is exactly what happened. That is exactly how I came to Christ as someone who was just as wicked and as evil as a person can possibly be. Um, I wasn't a serial killer, but you know the Bible is very clear that sin is sin, and so I was extremely wicked and I took joy in the sins that I committed I at first was running from God because I I believed in God and I had played Christian but eventually due to life circumstances I got angry at God and then went from being angry to not believing in God so long story short there's really no way to long story short but the way that I went from being someone who taught Sunday school, went to church every Sunday, and really thought I was a Christian, to being someone who did some of the things you're going to hear about tonight, is my wife and I lost our son. And once my son died, I kind of just lost. But before I get into the details of how I lost my son and how I came to Christ, I need to give you some background. So my dad, my birth father, 
was a Southern Baptist minister, and he loved the Lord with all of his heart. And all he wanted in the world for his only son, which was me, was to be a Christian. He told me many times that he did not care what I did when I grew up as far as for a living as long as I served Jesus and followed Christ. And he was diagnosed with leukemia when I was three, or actually when I was two, and he passed away when I was three. And I have got so many VHS tape of him preaching during his entire battle with leukemia. At the very end, he literally had to be carried up on the to the pulpit, up at the front of the church to the pulpit so that he could preach the gospel. He preached one of the most powerful sermons I have ever heard in my life when it was a week before he died. He preached one of the most powerful sermons I have ever heard. And I've got it on VHS along with the rest of his sermon. But he passed away and so my mom was a single mother trying to raise a child and when my dad died they had been together since she was 12 and he was 13 and she honestly had known nobody else he was not just her first love but only love and she had a nervous breakdown and it wasn't too long after he died i don't know exactly how long it was i don't remember but she ended up marrying uh, my dad's best friend um, and I've got pictures and a video of the wedding and she had only been out of the mental institution for a few months when they got married. The main reason that she married him was because they were also extremely good friends and he made a lot of convincing promises and she knew that she needed someone to raise me. She needed help uh, as far as fi uh, living financially. There was a lot involved, but when my dad passed away, we actually had a good bit of debt. This was the 80s, so insurance was nowhere near what it is today. And there were medical bills out of the wazoo. And anyway, she, uh, she married one of her best friends and my dad's closest friend who was not a Christian before my dad died and he never really thought my dad was going to die. Um, when he did pass away, uh, it did a lot of damage to my stepfather as well, but my stepdad and my mom's relationship was extremely toxic. I don't know if he um, resented me because I looked exactly like my father or what it was, but he was, um, I'm just going to tell it like it is because it's now 35 plus years later and he is very much a follower of Christ now and, you know, he and I have a good relationship, so there's no reason for me to hold back in the things that I say. He was abusive. Um, he was verbally abusive to both me and my mom. Um, and physically abusive more so to me than my mom, but to both, but definitely. And it was just a really, really bad situation, but he made sure that we were in church every time the doors were open. But life was a literal Hell, um, Monday through Saturday, or Monday through Saturday, other than Wednesday, but then on Wednesday and Sunday, it was just like a, a light switch flipped, and he, it was extremely hypocritical, and it made it to where I had it put in my head at a very young age that I wanted nothing to do with the hypocrisy of the church. 
and I didn't realize how much it affected my outlook until I was an adult and actually it was during the time when I was running from God that I really realized how much it had affected my outlook on the church and God and Christianity. But in any case, he and my mom were married until I was a teenager, and then they ended up divorcing, and my mom was a single parent once again, and her, my mom and he had a child together, my baby brother, and uh, he had children whenever they married as well, so it was a mixed family, and my brother's and they've always been my brothers and my sister, even though one was my half-brother and the others were my stepbrothers and stepsister. Um, one was two years older than me, one was two years younger than me, and the three of us were very much into the street life. And once I got into junior high school, I stopped caring about school completely. Uh, you know, I, I was to the age that I had hit puberty, and I, all I really cared about by the time I was 13 was girls, in my, and I was so deep with my older brother. My younger brother hadn't gotten deep into it yet, but me and my older brother were so deep into the street life and me, personally, into the gang life that... I failed the seventh grade twice, and eventually they placed me from junior high to high school. I, I never passed um, my uh, junior high years into high school. They, I guess, got sick of me and placed me up. But then I was in high school for not even a year before I was expelled, and then I was in alternative school, and once I went to alternative school, things just <laughs> went from bad to worse. I um, got very heavily involved with a gang that's local, but it's also nationwide. At the time, it was only in California, New York State, Georgia, and North and South Carolina. But when I was 15, I ran away from home and did a lot of things to when the approval of the people that I thought would uh, have my back for my entire life, which definitely was not true. Uh, but you know, when, when you're in when you're in the uh, a street gang and when you're in the street lifestyle, period, you think that your friends or your brothers are your family and. They call you family, and you call them family. And although we were definitely uh, very low income, and we didn't have much money, my mom cleaned houses for a living to provide for my younger brother and I. We we were not on welfare or um, even food stamps. Like by the time I became an adult, like everybody I knew was on food stamps pretty much but when I was a teenager I'm sure there was plenty of people who got assistance from the government and I didn't see anything wrong with it but my mom was the type of person that she had a lot of pride and she was just not gonna take anything from the government and so she cleaned houses and like I said when I was 15 a lot a lot of good and a lot of bad the good that happened that still other than Jesus Christ the best thing that has ever happened in my life was I met my wife at 15 and she and I started dating and we weren't dating very long at all before I had gone to jail for first degree burglary and a lot of other charges at 15 and I ended up in prison as a juvenile. Um, now, that's not the same as far as your record goes, 
as going to prison as an adult. And so my juvenile uh, record is sealed and is no longer on my record as like, you know, if I wouldn't have just told you that I went to prison at 15, you'd never know. But that's when I knew that my wife was 100% the woman that I was going to marry. Uh, I, I was very much in love with her, but at 15 years old, <laughs> she was loyal, faithful, and stuck by me the entire time I was incarcerated. Uh, she came with my mom uh, to the state capital of Columbia every single time mom would come and visit. Well, not every time because her stepdad wouldn't let her come for a while. I, I had to write him more letters than I wrote her, begging him to let her see me. And eventually he gave in. And at the time, you know, I thought it was because of my fast talking and my charisma. And, you know, it just goes to show the pride of men. Um, here I am sitting in prison and I'm thinking that the reason why he's allowing her to come see me is not because God is doing something, but because I'm just so good. I'm just such a good talker and such a good liar. And, uh, I finally got out and you know, she and I got really serious after that. Um, I convinced my mom and my mom got married actually. And the man that she married is the man that I call dad today. Um, he's also a pastor and he's one of the, he's one of the, trying to think of the right word the most loving men of god that i know he loves the lord probably more than any other grown man that i know including myself um he and i didn't i was very mistrusting when they uh, first got married because i had had a lot of things happen during my life that made me untrusting of him but he it didn't take long for him to win my trust and even before he went, uh, won my trust, I, I took advantage of him and his desire to win me over. And I was able to get him to buy me a car, not just any car, but um, uh, this was in the 90s. And I got him to buy me, a, I think it was a 96 uh, blue Mustang GT. And that car was, the only thing I loved more than that car was, who is now my wife, my girlfriend at the time, who's been my wife for 22 years. But that car ended up getting me in so much trouble. Less than a year after I got the car, I shot somebody in a drive-by. Uh, the car threw me deeper into gang life than I was before I went to prison. And by this time, my younger brother, who wasn't that much younger than me, he was only two years younger than me. My older brother was two years older than me, and he had, he was still involved in the street life, but he was very heavily addicted to drugs at this time, and he, he was an alcoholic before he was 18. But my younger brother and I literally became best friends, and you did not see one of us without seeing the other. And uh, I'll never forget it. I didn't even mean to shoot the guy. It, we um, we were going to buy some marijuana, and the guy, um, instead of getting the pot I wanted, after I'd given him the money, he uh, brought me back crack cocaine. And you know, I wasn't even 17 years old yet. I, I didn't want crack cocaine. And, uh, not when it was my weed money. Um, you know. It, it, wasn't like it was enough to sell or anything like that. It was, the guy was very much a drug addict. And I just got angry over, it was maybe $25. And the one thing I didn't know about the pistol is it had um, a three round burst feature or either there was a problem with the firing, you know, but I pulled the trigger once and it shot three rounds automatically. And so here I am, 16 years old, and my life was almost over in an instant, along with the
the life of somebody else that didn't do anything to deserve to die, and he didn't die. He did nothing to, I mean, he didn't die. He was just injured. And it was one of the worst things that I ever felt. And I'm telling you this as a, as a warning for anyone who's listening that's involved in the street lifestyle, especially at a young age, that you can not mean to hurt somebody and still hurt or even take their life. You don't have to be trying to do it for it to happen. But of course, being kids and being scared, we ran, we took off. Uh, I had a car, a fast car, and we took off. And I can't tell you to this day how I didn't get pulled over or how the cops weren't knocking on my front door the next day, but I didn't get pulled over and there was no cops knocking on the door the next day or any time after that. Um, I learned through mutual acquaintances that you just, the guy that was injured just went to the emergency room and only had to spend two nights in the hospital and was then released and made a pretty pretty fast recovery but it could have been horrible and you would think that the fact that I almost ruined my life and took somebody else's life would have been enough to wake me up but it did and I continued in the cycle of violence that particular night I had been at a bar, even though I was only 16, um, I looked a lot older than 16, and I had a fake ID, and I could get into every bar that was affiliated with the crew that I ran with, but I could also get into just regular bar, and even though a country western bar was definitely not my scene, that night I had been sitting at the bar in a country western bar, uh, taking shots of uh, a, a drink called Goldslaughter and dropping Xanax bars, two milligram Xanaxes in the shot. And so by the time I was on the corner in the hood, I was, I mean, I, I had absolutely zero critical thinking skills. Um, alcohol alone will make you do things you would never do normally. But when you mix um, tranquilizers with it, it takes what the alcohol does and it probably quadruples it and maybe quadruples it again. All I know is I, the next morning, I barely remembered what happened that night. And at that time, I actually had two vehicles. I had the Mustang and... Then I had my first vehicle, which was a truck. It was a low-rider truck with a, a camper shell on the back of it. It was a Nissan. And that was one that I had saved money up and paid for myself. And I didn't drive it very often unless the crew I was with went to the beach. And the next morning, my little brother, who had been uh, taking to tranquilizers and drinking just like me, woke up. In his only, he was only, it's funny, but it's not. He was only wearing his underwear. He was in his boxer brief. And he woke up before I did. And he woke our baby brother up, which, like I said earlier, was our half brother. Um, they had the same dad, and we had the same mom. And they went and got my keys and got in my truck. And a couple of roads down from where I lived was a dirt road, <laughs> and my Mustang wasn't a straight drive, but my truck was, and my brother, the one that was with me the night before, loved to drive a stick because he loved to burn out, and he went to that dirt road, and he was literally burning out through every gear on that dirt road, and he was just as tore up the next morning we were the night before, and I'm sure that because of that, it's the same reason that I was still asleep, but anyway, he um, made my baby brother ride
died with him. And I'm six years older than my baby brother, so if I was 16, he was only 10. And um, Jason, my younger brother, uh, went up on a, there was a huge ditch bank on both sides. And burning through the gears like that on that dirt road, he ended up at about 50 miles an hour, which isn't fast on a highway, but it is on a dirt road when you're, when you're dumping the clutch spinning the tires through every gear and he went up on the side of the embankment and flipped the truck uh, twice I believe and my baby brother got scared because of the way he was driving and I, I was like okay let me see what the problem is somebody said they can't hear oh the mic's on um give me just a second rattling bone street ministry please uh hope it has not been like that the whole time i am going to the only thing i know to do honestly first off i'm gonna cut the camera back on and take the uh headset off the only thing i truly know to do is connect it and use it instead of the studio mic I don't know about hearing, but you definitely can't see. I don't know if there's something on the camera or what. Okay, can you uh, tell me if the volume is any better now? Since I've got the Bluetooth volume is any better now. Okay, uh, on my phone it sounds. Since I've got the Bluetooth volume is any better now. Sounds okay, uh, on my phone it sounds. Since I've got the Bluetooth volume is any better now. I don't know if it's just on yours or if it was the uh, mic that wasn't picking up good, but it seems to be working pretty good okay you said better so that's good all right um uh, but i apologize i i um i i get into details a lot more than i should so if i start rambling and <laughs> need to move on just put something in the chat i'll see it and i'll move on but my little brother was in the truck and my baby brother and the way that my younger brother was driving was scaring him so he got out literally right after he got out my little brother went up that embankment and rolled the truck and it crushed the side the passenger side that my baby brother was on he would have been in i mean he, it would it would have hurt him bad and probably killed him and it killed my truck which i loved but not as much as my brother's and that was the second thing that should have woke me up. It was like back to back. First, I shoot somebody the night before, um, twice, uh, with the three round burst, he got shot twice. So first that happens and the next morning, um, my younger brother almost kills my baby brother and that didn't wake me up either. You would think it would have, but it didn't because I was still young. And when you're young, or at least when I was young, I felt invincible. And the only thing I really cared about was my girlfriend, who is now my wife. Um, I kind of, by the time... Um, that happened that night with the guy getting shot. I um, had to hide for quite a while um, because first I thought I was going to jail, but even when I realized I wasn't going to jail, I was in more danger than I was when I thought I was going to jail because the guy that I shot was 
the like the brother or the cousin or something of one of the very high up guys in the gang that I had been in since I was 13 or 14 and um, even though he wasn't actually a member and he wasn't down as we called it he was affiliated just by his family and his brothers and his brother-in-law wanted payback even though we were both a part of it we were a part of two different sets of the same gang and the way the things worked I've forgotten more than I ever learned but the set that I was a part of was interracial it was black white and Hispanic but it was even though it was uh, mixed racially it was still um, there was not a whole lot of white people in the gang in the city that I lived in and I had to go in hiding from my own people the people that I thought were my family <laughs> and I learned then that they definitely were not my family um, because the people I mean you know even blood families will you know if something like that happens they'll want revenge but the people who were supposed to be on my side were doing their best to find out where I was just to collect money that the brother of the guy who got shot had put on my head and it wasn't a lot of money either it was like a thousand dollars and so I learned right then that the guy that I ran away with at 15 that I got arrested initially with that caught the arrest that caused me to go to prison he was the one trying to collect all the money and so that was a good thing in the sense that it got me out of the gang life um, but it didn't get me out of the street life and I went from one out of the frying pan to the fire because my brother and I and some guys I went to school with started not a gang but it was actually a car club and we uh, might as well have been a crime syndicate because we sold drugs we did all kind of horrible things and the older I got the farther down into a life of crime I went and I would probably be dead by now but something happened that stopped all of it in its tracks for a while my girlfriend who i loved more than anything she was the air i breathed got pregnant with my daughter and i had already asked her to marry me when we were 17. actually we were i was 17 and she was 16. so when she turned 17 and was pregnant got pregnant with our daughter we got married right then I was 18 she was 17 and that getting married and having a little girl put I mean it was like the life I was living just it put the brakes on it I'll never forget seeing my baby girl for the first time and <laughs> I thought I knew what love was until I saw my child and from that moment on, all I cared about was her safety and providing for her. My wife and I, my wife had been going to church the, the entire time, but I was going to church with her then. Sorry to say it was a very charismatic church that would be considered a word of faith, New Apostolic Reformation today. But 
it was church, which was a lot better than where I had been. And I got baptized and I had I'd always read my Bible. Even when I was at my worst growing up, I loved Bible prophecy, end times prophecy. And growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, um, we, of course, were dispensationalist. And my favorite minister was David Jeremiah. Um, I had his entire uh, end times series on, I can't remember if it was cassette or CD, but it was called Escape the Coming Night. I had the books as well. And uh, I never dreamed that the world would get as bad as it is today without <laughs> um, Christ coming back to judge this world because as bad as it was then, you know, I just knew that it, it was going to end. But just as the Bible tells us, and I can't remember if it's first or second Peter, but you know, God is not slack according, you know, with his promises. Um, he's actually long suffering and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to Christ. And a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. And so even though I was looking for the rapture, I was not living like the world was going to end, and so there was no need to live a Christian life. Um, you know, after I got baptized, I um, was in church every time the doors were open. Um, I loved singing praise and worship because <laughs> the church that we went to was honestly just a bunch of emotionalism. And so I love church, man. It, it was almost like getting high again to be in the church and to have my hands up praising the Lord. And I'm not saying that I wasn't sincere or that the people, you know, in the church wasn't sincere. I know my wife was definitely sincere. Um, the first time I ever heard, first time I ever heard anybody pray in tongues was my wife. Um, I've had bulldogs my entire life and not long after we got married she's had chihuahuas not now but when we were growing up she did not long after we got married um, my pit bull bit her chihuahua just once but her tooth went in my wife's dog's head and we thought she was dying, but she was honestly just going into shock. And when Eve bit Ruthie, my wife started praying in tongues. And I thought I was scared when the blood was pouring out of Ruthie's, the top of Ruthie's head. But when my wife started praying in what sounded to me like Russian, that's when I got scared. I'm telling you, I... I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church where the most that would happen during praise and worship was somebody might raise one hand or say amen when the preacher was preaching. But there was definitely no praying in tongues or emotionalism or even true worship. So, you know, it was honestly like a, a, a drug to me. But at the same time, when it was happening, I felt sincere. I mean, in my mind, it was sincere worship out of love. And like I said, I started teaching Sunday school. And in um, 2003, my son was born, my oldest son. He's two years younger than my oldest child, my daughter. And um, 
not long after that, my other son was born, my next oldest. And um, long story short, my wife and I moved to North Carolina, to Fayetteville, um, and my mom and who is now my dad, they actually moved to a place called Spring Lake. My dad took a job at a church. He was the uh, senior pastor at an Advent Christian church. And if you don't know what the Advent Christian denomination is, Google it because I've already been going for an hour because I'm long-winded. But while we were living in North Carolina and going to the Advent Christian Church, and I was teaching Sunday school there, that's when I felt with all of my heart the call to go into the ministry. I mean, it wasn't a doubt in my mind. Um, I just knew. And there was a seminary in Fayetteville. And I actually, um, because of some things that happened when I was a child, um, not long after my dad died, but my dad dying, and then um, I was molested at age six um, and I had a lot of guilt for things I had done in my life I, I had hurt a lot of people um, physically emotionally um, you know I had shot that guy I had in order to get into the gang that I was in I had to do something it's called blood in blood out and I honestly was not supposed to be able to leave without dying. My death was supposed to be the way I got out. But, thank the Lord, that didn't happen. But the way I got in was horrible. And all of these things just... I've always had a conscience. Always had a conscience. Even at my worst. And it was eating me up inside. And my counselor, I had a counselor, and he was actually going to seminary to be a pastor. And um, that's how I found the first seminary that I attended was through him. Um, and I was in school for about a year. And then in 2011, um, my wife and I had another child, but before he was born, and he was named after me actually, Jeremy Blake Anderson Jr. But before he was born, um, not long before he was born, uh, my wife was having horrible headaches, migraines. And so she went to the doctor and she ended up seeing a neurologist. And one thing I forgot to tell you guys, I lost my dad at age three to leukemia. My wife lost her mom at age 13 to a brain aneurysm. And when she was pregnant with our son, Blake, which is what we called him, um, when she went to, when she was having the migraines, when she went to the neurologist, they did a MRI and found out that she had a brain aneurysm. And not only did she have a brain aneurysm, but it was behind her right eye, and it was in her carotid artery and attached to her ocular nerve. And so it could not be removed. Needless to say, it scared her to death, and she has always been my life. When the Bible talks about um, you know, a man leaving his mother and father and clinging to his wife and the two becoming one flesh. I wouldn't, you know, I would have taken that as literal as possible if I didn't know the scripture. If I had never read that scripture, I would have. 
believed it and lived it because she's just she completed me you know I didn't see us as two separate people I saw us as one person and I still do um, but in 2011 they found the brain aneurysm and they were telling us that they couldn't operate on it for two reasons one where it was at but two because she was pregnant and um, so the only thing they could do was take our son via c-section and she had never had a cesarean section all of our children were born naturally until uh, Blake she had him cesarean section and he was premature very premature but they had to take him for to be able to take care of her and once he was in the NIC unit they um, did surgery on her. They couldn't take the aneurysm out, but the only thing they could do to buy her time if it was to rupture and save her life, buy her time to get to the hospital and save her life, was to do something called a brain coiling surgery. What they did was they put a titanium coil around the aneurysm. And um, the uh, titanium coil, it actually, I'm sorry guys, I'm not trying to stop in the middle of talking. I was just trying to figure out what in the world was causing this to be so blurry. In any case, um, they... Um, They did the surgery and they put the coil around the aneurysm and we moved from there back here to South Carolina where uh, we were both from, kind of. I had lived here my whole life, but my wife was actually from Florida and um, she had lived here the majority of her life though. And we moved back here because here's where our family was. We had a premature newborn child and she had, even though she had the coil, she had a life-threatening illness. And that meant I had to stop going to seminary. And I did, and we moved back to South Carolina. And we were here <laughs> less than a month before I was doing drugs again. And I'm ashamed of that, but I didn't come on here to lie to you guys. I came on here to be as open as possible. To try and hopefully stop someone from making the same mistakes that I made. I was um, not doing any street drugs. Well, I was not doing any street drugs in the sense of cocaine or heroin or anything like that, but I was buying opiate-based pain medicine off the street, and before I knew it, I was addicted to it. I was snorting it, and it wasn't long before I was extremely addicted. Uh, addicted. My grandmother sent me to rehab. I was in rehab on my birthday, uh, March the 27th, um, 2012. I was in rehab. Um, I didn't stay even close to the full month or 21 days or however long I was supposed to stay there. Stayed there for maybe a week. I left because they wouldn't let me smoke in there and it, honestly it was just an excuse to leave. That's what it boiled down to. It was an excuse to leave. So I left and like I said that was March 27th, 2012. And A 
April the 11th, 2012, my wife was staying at her sister's. She spent the night at her sister's with our baby, the youngest, Jeremy Jr., who we called Blake. And um, my daughter, my oldest, and my oldest son was at home with me. And um, they, I'll never forget that night, as long as I live. They slept in the bed with me that night. We watched movies until we fell asleep. And there was no bedtimes. I let them stay up as late as they wanted. And uh, about two o'clock in the morning, I woke up to the dogs barking up a storm and somebody knocking on the door. No beating on the door and uh, I got one of my guns and went to the door to see who it was just in case it was somebody trying to break in or something it was definitely I, I wish it had been somebody trying to break in but it wasn't it was my brother-in-law um, again my wife had stayed with her sister which was only a mile and a half down the road from where we live, um, it was my brother-in-law, my wife's sister's husband, and when I answered the door, he was freaking out, yelling at me, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, uh, Blake stopped breathing, um, I don't know if he's dead or alive, uh, they took him to the hospital in ambulance, he wasn't breathing when they left, but um, he and Brianna are at the hospital. We've got to go. So I got my other two babies up. My daughter was 13, and um, my son was 11. And um, I got them up, and my brother-in-law drove them to his house on the way to the hospital. And... Uh, I prayed. I, I hadn't prayed honestly, even though I was going I was going to seminary in North Carolina not long before this. But then I got here and this town when I was young it was always my kryptonite, you know. I, even when we lived we lived in uh, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta for a good while. We lived in Savannah, we lived in Brunswick, and we lived in North Carolina. And um, ah, I can't think of the name of the town. Concord, North Carolina first, and then in Fayetteville. But uh, regardless to where we lived, I could not even drive through this town without doing something that was not just a sin, but willful sin. Either going to a bar, um, and I know when I say this, there's going to, especially women, there's going to be a lot of you who hear it and say, you've sat here and talked about how your wife was your life. And she was, and she is. But you would have to You'd have to talk to my psychiatrist from when I was young to understand the reason why I did the things I did when it came to um, infidelity. Uh, but I, um, I would come through here and have an affair, uh, a one night stand. I would come through here and get high, I would come through this town and get drunk, go to bars. I mean, I couldn't even drive through the town. But I'll never forget that night on the way to the hospital. Um, after all of my sin, willful sin, I prayed all the way to the hospital. God, please just let my baby be okay. If you'll please just let my baby be okay. I will surrender my life to you completely. 
I will go in the ministry. Um, I mentioned earlier, I didn't, I don't know if you guys heard or not, but when I lived in Fayetteville, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, was calling me into full-time ministry. And I tried to bargain with God on the way to the hospital. Lord, if you will please just let my baby live, I will go into any kind of ministry you want. And so we get to the hospital, and my brother-in-law and I walked in, and um, we told the nurses or the triage people and the check-in people up at the front desk who we were there for and there was no wait they knew exactly who I was who I was there for they took me straight in the back and I thought everything was fine I thought God had answered my prayers because before I even got to the room saw my wife the door to the room was open and she was holding the baby so to me it looked like he was okay But I, um, I got to the hospital room, the emergent, the ER room. And um, when I got close enough to see him completely, all of my sins, the people I had hurt, The man I had shot at 16, the man I had beat until he was unrecognizable at 14, and every other sin, just, this is why Satan is called the accuser, because he brought everything I had ever done wrong to my mind. And so when I saw my sons, he wasn't even blue, he was gray. And if I live to be a hundred, I will never be able to get, I mean, I'll never forget or be able to not see what he looked like. I, honestly, except for pictures and videos, I don't have my own memories of what he looked like alive because when I think about him, all I can see is that and so anyway uh, I, I don't know why or what these nurses were thinking but the whole reason that they that I had to see him at all and the whole reason that my wife had him was because these geniuses handed him to her and she would not give him up. I will never forget. She kept saying over and over and over, Jesus can bring my baby back. At the time, I honestly don't know if I believed that Jesus could bring him back or not, but I do know that I didn't believe he would. <clears throat> and um, the nurses, many nurses, tried to get him from her, but she was not having it. 
she would not give him up. And finally, after what seemed like a lifetime, it was only like 30 minutes, but it seemed like forever. I, um, I said to her, sweetheart, can I please hold our son? And she handed him to me. I, I knew that I had to do that because I knew the nurses were not going to get him from her. But I thought it was bad the way he looked until he was in my arms. Uh, I would not wish that on my worst enemy. I handed him to the closest nurse to me as fast as I could. And my wife flipped out, went to hitting me in the shoulders, the chest, the face. She, I mean, she had just lost her son, and as much as it hurt me, I, I can't imagine being a mom who carries a child in their womb. And my wife has breastfed every child we've ever had, and it's been good for them, but it's also created a bond between her and our children that I don't think would have been there otherwise so when Blake died it was like something inside of her died and she finally calmed down I put my arms around her to stop her from wailing on me but also to comfort her she cried in my shoulder and just when I thought things couldn't get any worse the police came in and pulled us out <laughs> they took us to the chapel of all places and then and they separated us they grilled us and grilled us and accused us of taking the life of our own child. I told them that, yeah, it was my fault because I wasn't there. He wasn't at home. She wasn't at home. I was at home with my two oldest children. She had spent the night at her sister's, and I felt like if I had asked her to stay home, then things may have been different. But one of the, actually, he was a cop, but he was the lead investigator for the coroner's office, and he was also my second cousin. And when I was probably 11 years old, um, his name's Terry. Terry and Samantha, my cousin and his wife, lost their daughter that was very close to our son's age in a uh, car accident. A uh, semi-truck ran a red light and um, hit the car that uh, Randy, my, it's my technically cousin, but I called her my niece. Um, she was in the truck with uh, her babysitter and uh, it killed her instantly. So he stopped, he put a immediate stop. First of all, he knew me and he knew that even though I had a very rough start, that once I got married and my children came into my life, they became my life. 
and he also knew what it was like to as a child. So he put a stop to that nonsense. And um, he actually helped me more than you can imagine. My wife had a nervous breakdown and uh, we still had two children, three children actually. Um, we had a 10 year old, 11 year old, well excuse me, a 11 year old, a 12 year old, and a, wait a minute, we had a 13 year old, an 11 year old, and a 10 year old. But uh, the 10 year old um, lived with his mom. Um, he was my son, but not my wife's. And that's a product of my infidelity. <laughs> Honestly, it's the product of one night of infidelity. <laughs> that's just, you know, all it takes. But he was a blessing to myself, my wife. He calls my wife mom. Um, they've always had a very close relationship. I've always been very thankful of that. But anyways, um, I had two children that lived with us that I had to think about. But my wife had a nervous breakdown, and I had to be strong for the children and for her. So I uh, held all the pain and everything inside after Blake died. I didn't cry, not even once. I just held it in and locked it in a compartment in my mind. And I just didn't think about it. My wife, um, she, she has always been close with all of our children. But when we lost our son, like I said, it broke her. And she ended up in a mental institution just like my mom did when my dad died. And um, while I was trying to be strong for her, take care of our two children, provide for our family I just wasn't able to make ends meet because I you have to understand I, I had never graduated high school at this point I didn't even have a GED at this point so I went back to what I knew which was the streets and selling drugs and robbing drug dealers <laughs> not citizens but I became a stick up kid and a drug dealer myself I reconnected with my best friend who was like my brother um, matter of fact my baby brother married his sister they aren't married anymore and I have to say thank God I know God hates divorce but they should have never gotten married trust me um, but his my best friend who I called my brother his name was Michael but we all called him Little Willie and uh you know, I wasn't selling drugs yet. He and I just reconnected, and we were going out and partying and whatnot, but, you know, I was trying to work out a job, but I was not making enough money, not even close. And Michael had sold drugs as long as I had known him. Um, you know, I... 
earlier when I was telling you guys about how I grew up, where I grew up, how even though my mom was a single mother, she cleaned houses to provide for us. And even though I was in the street and chose the life that I was in, it was chosen. I didn't have to be in the street. I didn't have to be doing the things I was doing when I was a teenager. But Little Willie did. He had to sell drugs to feed his little sister. He had to take care of his family. And when I say his family, I mean his mom and his sister and his grandmother and He, uh, he was a genuine street kid. He lived in the ghetto, the one of the worst neighborhoods around here. The only neighborhood I know of that's worse than where Willie grew up is the neighborhood that he and I hung out in when I was gangbanging. And the neighborhood that it's the same neighborhood the neighborhood that my wife and I ended up moving into when I don't know I may have been 19 um, <laughs> it's crazy we were trying to better ourselves and our lives but we moved to the absolute worst part of town um, we were able to get a triple wide mobile home that was rent to own and put it on a lot one of the very few lots that was in that neighborhood that didn't have a government house on it so we lived there um, my wife's sister myself my wife's sister at the time both of her sisters were strippers <laughs> they worked somewhere called the trophy club actually that's not true her older her oldest sister was a stripper um, the one who uh, got the triple white in her name angel she was a cocktail waitress at the strip club and uh, I used the strip club to sell drugs. My wife didn't like me being there, but she had both of her sisters to make sure I didn't do anything wrong, I suppose. Anyhow, Michael and I reconnected after my son died. And we... became really close again and I was trying to figure out how I was going to support us and how I was going to feed my family and Willie said I'll tell you how we're gonna survive we're gonna sell dope well he had always at least sold pot and for a while during his adult life cocaine heroin and pills well he had all the connections so because I mean I had not been in the drug game or street lifestyle for years before we moved back here I was going to seminary to be a pastor but all that was out the window or so I thought um, he um, introduced me to several people that he knew that sold whatever he wanted and there was another friend of ours that uh had also sold drugs um, all through junior high, high school, and his adult life. 
and he didn't just sell drugs, but he <laughs> he didn't believe in banks. He buried his money in his yard. And my little brother, the one that wrecked my truck, well, he and this guy were best friends at one time. But my younger brother and I had been best friends since I was 15 and he was 13. And we were family. So that trumped any friendship he had with this guy. He lived with this guy. So because of that, I knew where the money was buried. And so a plan was put into motion and hatched. And um, Long story short, without giving details, it's going to get me taken off of YouTube. Um, we, uh, my younger brother, my best friend who was like my brother and myself, <clears throat> ended up with about $30,000 in cash, and I know that there was a lot more than that buried on that land, but some people, money is their life, their God, their everything. And we couldn't, or we, I couldn't get him to tell me where anything else was. And I wasn't 15 anymore. And even when I was 15, I did not shoot that guy on purpose. I really did not. But I definitely was not going to shoot somebody that I had known my entire life, gone to school with, and genuinely liked just because he wouldn't tell me where his money was hidden or all of his money was hidden. So I took the money that he gave up and we used it to start our drug empire and before it was over it was an empire. Um, my son died in 2012. He died April the 11th, 2012. Well, he was buried Friday, April the 13th, 2012. <laughs> well, even when we are at our worst, this is how, see, people who don't understand predestination and people who believe the lie of Calvinism that God has chosen our path and chosen who will be saved and won't be saved before the foundation of the world, that's a lie from the pits of hell. We make our own choices and our choices decide who we're going to be, what we're going to be, and if we're going to be able to come to Christ or not. If we're going to come to Christ, the Holy Spirit is who decides if we're going to be able to, because if you are not convicted by the Holy Spirit, then you, you can't just get saved whenever you want to. However, though, God does know who's going to do what, and he does act on our behalf accordingly. And God knew who I would end up being, what I would end up being, and where I would end up. So, God did intervene, and even though I was actually happy being a stick-up kid, because I was able to be a gangster again, and the gangster lifestyle has always appealed to me. I'm not going to lie or sugarcoat anything. Um, the mafia lifestyle has always appeared, appealed to me. Um, street gangs, not so much, although that's the only gangster 
lifestyle I ever lived was that of a foot soldier in a street gang. The kind of lifestyle that I wanted to live <laughs> was like a, a capo in La Casa Nostra, you know, the mafia. But that didn't happen, thank the Lord, because the mafia, <laughs> people think that the mafia is just Italian bad guys, drug dealers and whatnot. No. The mafia is a Sicilian group of people, especially men, that are into the occult. Anyhow, um, God saw fit to protect me, and <laughs> he actually allowed my little brother to eventually get off of the kick he had been on since we were teenagers and get married and he married my best friend who I called my brother he married his sister and Michael um, and I got very close he moved in with my wife and I and we did sell drugs before I knew it that $30,000 had turned into about triple that and we were flipping about at least a half a kilo of cocaine a week. Um, we didn't, there were a few people we sold powder cocaine to, but most people wanted rock cocaine, crack cocaine. So we, that's what we got in. That's the business we got in was the crack business. Little did I know that the crack business was a lot more dangerous than just the regular cocaine business. And um, Michael, Little Willie, was a partner in business and he was my best friend in life. But just like I was married and had children, he also was married and he had two children. A little boy and a little girl. And um, his wife, Jordan, um, had their children. And she had left him because before he and I had hooked back up and became friends again. I honestly didn't know this. Um, the guy who had been a drug dealer my whole life ended up being one of the most hardcore drug addicts that I would ever know. And he ran up quite a debt. But he also... Um, made our home life happy. My wife has always been the type person that she likes to entertain. She loves to have guests over and she knew that Michael and I were selling drugs but she put it out of her mind because we had company. And it was company that she loved and hadn't seen since we were kids. But, um, something wonderful happened that 
I still can't believe. My wife was in no shape for romance after my son died. And I was in no shape for romance, but I was extremely lustful. And I, it wasn't just lustful. I was hurting very bad inside. And I realized that when I was with a woman, especially, it had to be a strange woman, someone other than my wife. Not only did I not think about Blake, but I didn't feel the pain. So I found myself with a different woman at least every weekend, but it wasn't long before I was with a different woman every night. And so that makes this miracle all that much more awesome. There was one night that Michael actually talked me into staying home. And uh, my wife and I were together that night, one time, one night, one time. <laughs> and from us being together that one time, she got pregnant with our son, Connor who anybody who knows me at all knows Connor and his story. And that child is the biggest blessing God has ever given me. He loves the Lord like nobody I've ever known, even adults. He can quote scripture better than most adults I know. And it would have never happened without that one night and without Michael being there. But after that, my wife, um, She actually started doing drugs herself. Um, not like I was doing them before um, our son died and before all hell broke loose. But she was just trying to numb the pain, that's all. And she failed miserably. <laughs> but as soon as she found out she was pregnant with our son, Connor, she quit the drugs immediately and quit drinking. And um, eight months later, even though she was still a little premature, <laughs> Connor was born through C-section and it was mainly for our peace of mind although I don't know why because it didn't do anything but they sent us home with a heart monitor a halter monitor <laughs> he is the biggest blessing God has ever given me. I was so focused and not break down. My wife, um, 
she and my best friend who I called my brother they were very close um, they had always been close he and I were very close and we um were selling drugs a lot and like idiots we were selling them out of my house well we ended up hooking up with the biggest drug dealer in the area the city of Darlington or Florence at the time and he was only 24 years old <laughs> we uh we're going to ask to borrow the money from him, but there's a lot of reasons why we couldn't. But the next guy, um, he was also one of the biggest drug dealers in South Carolina, and he may have been more successful and bigger than my friend that was who we went to originally. He was definitely doing better on the surface. But he... Um, ended up having to do some things for me actually um, like cut my grass and just regular things that are not a part of street life and it was during and right after this that um he asked if we could all team up, partner up. And normally with something like that, I would have voted, but there was nobody to vote with. Um, so we teamed up and essentially became a crew. And, um, My son was born, the one that I was telling you about that was such a blessing from God. He was born in March, not two weeks from my birthday, on March the 18th, um, hold on, yeah, 2013, and I didn't know why God had to take Blake, but I did know that I wouldn't trade Connor for anything in the world, including to get Blake back. Connor literally became the apple of my eye. <laughs> he still is. Anyone who's ever met him will tell you that he is the most special child that you could ever meet. Sorry, I've got to plug this up. But he loves the Lord. He loves the Bible. Um... Uh, he knows more about the Bible than so many adults. Where can I plug this up? Maybe I can't. Anyhow, he uh
grew up so fast. Um, but when he was a toddler, he was the cutest thing in the world. We've got so many videos. And even as, like, now, um, he is in the fifth grade, and he... He has got a heart for the Lord and for people like I have never seen in a child before. But Michael had moved in with us, as I said. Little Willie moved in with us. And um, we were doing very, very well selling drugs. We were making, I mean, we weren't millionaires, but we were making easily. 70 grand a year which you know it's not a kingpin and the guy that we met his nickname is Maine like the state and that's part of his real name but everyone calls him Maine and he um, had a rivalry with the other biggest cocaine dealer in the area. <laughs> and it wasn't long before he had ordered. He and I, uh, Little Willie and I, started getting our product from Maine. And Normally, we would just get it and go home. But that night, Maine said that he had a couple of stops to make. He stopped at the store right down from his house, like I had planned and thought we were doing the whole time. But Maine... Uh, saw somebody that he knew from church of all places inside the convenience store and <laughs> he um, could have gone in so many different directions he got into a welding program at the technical college here. It's called Florence Darlington Tech. And contrary to popular belief, you do not have to go and take um, any kind of courses or anything that isn't a part of what you are a part of and <laughs> he always insisted on taking his drops going on drops and <sighs> he um reached out to a friend of his, well, I say friend, an acquaintance that did tattoos. He had a tattoo gun. He was an awesome artist. And he, um,
he organized a tattoo party two for two nights in a row at my house. My mom um, <laughs> she uh came here and they actually didn't get to talk at all while he was in school. Honestly, wish that I didn't vividly remember everything about Willie's last night on Earth, but. He, um, put himself in harm's way more times than I can count for me, and even more times for Brianna, my wife. He organized the tattoo party through a guy who had a pretty serious drug problem, but was also an amazing tattoo artist. Now, I want to state right now that as an Anabaptist and a minister, I do not condone or agree with tattoos. But when I was 25, or however, however old I was in um, 2013, I not only agreed with them, but I got them all the time. Oh. <sighs> the guy for one tattoo and it was a simple see we paid him in drugs we paid him with cocaine and the original tattoo was just this grim reaper forget the letters it was just the grim reaper and the grim reaper is in chains and it stands for conquering death Oh, just for anybody who thinks I was making the gang stuff up, I uh, am also covered with gang tattoos. This is where I tried to get it covered up, but you can see the six-pointed Star of David, which is not Star of David, it's a Star of Rim fan. But anyone who knows anything about me or listens to the Remnant Report <laughs> or knows that I wrote a book on exposing Kabbalah, you know that I definitely do not support Zionism or Rabbinic Judaism, so I wouldn't have got this asinine, Lord forgive me, if that's a curse word, I don't know if it is or not, but it's something my grandmother used to say all the time, but I would have never gotten this tattoo for any other reason. Um, I've got a, another one on this arm. And I got another gang tattoo on my leg, but I can't get it up to show you right in a second. But 
no matter. Um, you just have to take my word for it. But regardless, um, we had the tattoo party, and the only thing I got was the Grim Reaper in chains, and then I left. I'm so ashamed of where I was at. I was extremely intoxicated. We sold hard drugs, but we partied hard. We drank, we popped pills, we weren't addicted to anything but money and fun. But <clears throat> that night, see, I got Xanaxes from the doctor. My wife got Klonopin from the doctor, Ambien from the doctor. Somas from the doctor. And that night, every drug I just named, I was taking. Earlier that day, Willie and I ran into a, a girl that I went to school with. That I knew in school that she was head over heels in love with me and I took advantage of that when, when we were in school. I did not even, I liked her a lot. She was a very cool person. She was a good friend. But the only romantic interest I had in her was lust. And when we slept together as teenagers, she was a virgin. And so she fell in love with an idiot like me for whatever reason. And from that moment on, I could get her to do anything I wanted. The guy that I ran away with at 15. Because she was also gang related and affiliated. Um, I didn't ask. I told her that she had to go on a date with Ryan, the guy who I ran away with and went to prison with, and she did. And when I got out of prison as a juvenile, that was when I had met and fallen in love with my wife and I didn't have anything else to do with her or any other females until we were married. <laughs> Makes no sense but it's the truth and her name I can't tell you her last name. She's married now for the second time <laughs> but she had just gotten divorced when me and Willie saw her that day and you know, she had just gone through a divorce, and that had taken its toll, and she was super excited to have reconnected with me. I was excited to have reconnected with her. It was like I had completely forgot that God had just taken my son and given us another son that was more than I could ever hope for. But that night while Michael, little Willie, was getting 
the sleeve tattoo done. I was with Destiny, that was her name. That is her name. I'm not going to say her last name. I was at her apartment with her while the tattoo party was going on here. And <clears throat> Willie got an entire sleeve. He got his entire arm on both arms covered in tattoos. He got a sleeve on both arms. And like I said, we paid for the tattoos with cocaine. Well, two nights in a row, we had the tattoo party. Both nights, I was in the next town over. <clears throat> fornicating and committing adultery. My mother was even here. This is God. Uh, I'm about to give you guys the good news of this horrible situation. My mom was here from, she lives two or three hours away, but she was here for whatever reason. Probably, well no, it wasn't because we had lost our son, because it had been a year since then. Um, whatever reason, mom was here. And even though I wasn't, when Lil Willie finished um, getting his tattoos, he, um, my mom was talking to him about the Lord. She was witnessing to him. And I had tried a little, but... I was actually scared that I was going to do more harm than good because it was more than obvious that I wasn't living a Christian lifestyle. But anyway, she showed him the videos of my dad preaching before he died. Michael said, Miss Donna, I want what he's got talking about my dad. And my mom didn't know any better. She does now. But at the time, she didn't know any better as far as the sinner's prayer goes. The whole model of a sinner's prayer. She didn't know the flaws of it. But she did know the good parts of it so that's the parts that she went over with him and um, he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior I know this for a fact. He, um, been up for two nights in a row, Michael had. He was extremely tired. My son, Connor, the one that is the miracle child, he wanted something. I don't know what it was. But we went to Walmart in Hartsville. And I'm saying that like you guys know this area. Anyways, it's about a 20 mile drive from here. There's a lot closer Walmarts than that one. But that's where I went. And the 
there was crab and another department and there was um, I forget what it's called it's in the deli part of Walmart um, it's a seafood too but we got we, we got that stuff from Walmart to go home and cook and while we were there Michael actually Louie met somebody I mean not met him for the first time but he called somebody to come and uh, he bought two different kinds of pills from them And if you remember, he had been up for two nights in a row doing only God knows what kind of drugs to stay up. But he was tired of staying up and he wanted to go to sleep. And, you know, I don't blame him for that. But while we were in Walmart, I mean, I've got pictures, I've got videos. He was pushing Connor, who was only six months old at the time. He was pushing him in the buggy. They were playing a uh, race car. Connor was just laughing up a storm. Michael was playing. He was fine. On the way home, he was just... He was 100% fine. There was nothing wrong with him. Except for he hadn't had any sleep. So he was tired. Anyway, um, he, um, had a lot of fun that morning with Connor, but we got home. And even though he was wide awake in the car, he couldn't even walk up the steps by himself. He walked to the house, I helped him, and um, I helped him to the bedroom, one room over from my office where I'm at now. The room was actually, at the time, it was my little girl, my daughter's bedroom. I'm sorry, <laughs> my ring came off my, my finger. But I went and helped him lay down in my daughter's bed. And I had to go and do a run. We were supposed to go do it, but he was too out of it, so I had to go. I mean, it was a $10,000 run. I, he could not do it. I went. I, I did it. It wasn't even that far from the house. I got there, met the people, made the exchange, and no sooner than we made the exchange, my phone rang. And it was my mama freaking out. I mean, screaming, crying. Then it was my daughter saying, Uncle Michael's not breathing. Uncle Michael's not breathing. Well, like I said, man, I was maybe a mile and a half from my house. I don't know what the record is time-wise for a mile and a half. But I can tell you for 
a V6 turbocharged engine. I guarantee you nobody's made that faster than I have. They actually, maybe they have because I didn't care anything about yards or anything. I drove through people's yards. And then when I got here, neither an ambulance, fire truck, nothing. I even got here yet. <sighs> I am going to turn this over. Michael, when I got back to the house, he wasn't breathing. My mom was a nurse. She was doing CPR. The EMTs, the fire department was there. An ambulance was there. The rescue squad was there. None of them knew how to do CPR. None. So, it was my mom and I doing CPR. I was doing chest compressions, she was breathing. Then we switched up, she was doing chest compressions, and I was breathing for him. He, um, died right there in my daughter's bedroom. They could have given him. It wasn't until later when they did his talk screen that I found out what he had taken. But it was very obvious that he had overdosed. I mean, Yes, he had been awake for two days and night, so yes, he was really tired. He lay down, went to sleep. He was on his side when I left him, but he rolled over on his back and he threw up. And he drowned, choked on his own vomit. The night before, though, he, uh, was asking questions about the Lord. I wasn't there to answer them, but my mom was. And mom let him watch the videos of my dad. In the final stages of leukemia, being wheeled up on the stage to the pulpit, preaching his heart out while he was dying. I never forgot that. Even though I sold drugs for many years after Michael died. <clears throat> and I had several 
business partners. They were none my brother, like he was my brother. But there were several people that tried to take his place as my right hand. But <clears throat> he had some really big shoes to fill. Because we're talking about a guy who, even though he was not a Christian, he would give you the shirt off his back. And he wasn't a Christian. when he did so many things that are characteristic with Christians. I, um, told my wife the truth. I admitted that I was with another woman that night. Both nights. And I Apologized. I asked for forgiveness. What a joke. Not where God is concerned. But I'm not God. She's not God. And it's hard to it's hard to forgive infidelity. The reason it's hard is because someone who you trust has broken your trust and I had broken her trust but she knew how bad I was hurting and how much I needed her and she remembered when our son died how bad off she had been. And that I um, I knew things that could either make or break our family. And as horrible as Little Willie dying was, and it was horrible, the worst was yet to come. I did go um, I went to where the so hard for me to open up about it, but I um, went 
to Maine's where we got our drugs and told him well I went to tell him what happened with Michael but when I got there he wasn't there and he and I were very close then not as close as Willie and I by any means but he and I had become a lot more than just drug supplier and drug dealer we were friends his mom lived right behind him and he and his baby mama lived in a double wide trailer in the middle of the hood and his mom lived in the apartments behind it and uh I was talking with his, I think it was his baby mom. I found out the night that I was, the night before that I was gone. He had actually called me that night when I was in Florence with a girl who I thought, I mean, it's a long story, but I was never going to leave my wife. I loved her and still do love her more than anything. But I thought I could have my cake and eat it too. And I felt really bad for the way I treated Destiny when we were kids. So I thought I could have my cake and eat it too. But she wasn't interested in that. She wanted payback. <laughs> and she got it. But the reason she got it is because I was at my most vulnerable point. It had been less than a year since my son had died and only a day and a half since my best friend who I called my brother had died she pretty much just told me to hit the road Jack I can't remember her exact words, but it was something like paybacks of B-I-T-C-H or something like that. I really, at the time, I could have cared less about any of that. I needed moral support, emotional support. And I got it from my wife, from the woman who is through thick and thin stuck by me. I stuck by her too. She has not been perfect by any means, so don't misunderstand. You're not going to be married for 22 years without you both messing up in some way, shape, or form. But anyways, uh, <laughs> when I talked to Maine's baby mama I found out that the night before he had gone uh, he was out I don't know what he was doing he might have been partying he might have been picking something up but when what happened happened he was at the gas station and he went to pay for gas Maine was young he was only 24 years old <laughs> 24 years old he was almost a millionaire but he um, stopped at the gas station. He walked in and he was going to fill his car up with gas. He took out a wad of money to pay for gas. I mean, a wad of money. <laughs> there was a dope fiend in the store that saw all the money. <laughs> Happened to be somebody that he used to go to church with. The guy used to be a deacon at his church. <clears throat> so when the guy came and asked for a ride, Maine didn't hesitate. He gave him the ride. We found out later that it wasn't just a random robbery where somebody that he grew up in 
went to school with and that knew him um, just decided at the last minute to find somebody to rob him. No, it wasn't like that. I mean, it made more sense to rob me because I was definitely the most upset and vulnerable. But it's neither here nor there. He, um, he remembered a good bit from when we were young on how to mark where you're at and um, somebody took his stuff out of the trash can the drugs and somebody um, was going to take his money not from him, though. Sad part about it is the person they sent to do it was my brother. <laughs> it's actually not sad. It was a good thing because he did. But. All of that led to that night and when Maine took out that wad of money the guy that he um he knew him from church he was a deacon at his church he asked Maine for a ride he asked him if he could give him a ride home and Maine not thinking anything of it said yeah well he took the guy home and they got to the guy's house that wasn't really his house and he got out of the car but he didn't shut the door he just opened the door and he, he didn't even get out at first he just opened the door he turned and looked at the main and he pulled out a pistol and he pointed it at his head he told him to give him all of his money jewelry and drugs and Maine refused. He wouldn't give him anything. <laughs> he asked him again. And when he asked him again, he told him he wasn't going to ask him a third time. And Maine didn't think he was serious. He thought he was joking. I'll never understand that, how you can think somebody is joking. But... Um, waited until they were parked and he had the gun pulled on him the door was open he shot him kept shooting actually he got out of the car first he leaned in with the gun and asked him for the drugs and then shot him and Maine is a big old guy he's over 6 foot tall and he's close to 300 pounds he makes me look small and I'm over 250 but Maine reached and grabbed him, grabbed hold of him, and that's when the guy took and emptied the gun into him. And with an entire clip of bullets in his head, face, and chest, and all all right here his entire upper body riddled with bullets he drove off drugged the guy down the road and then ran over him 
wasn't because he was being hard or anything like that. He was scared to death. He knew he was going to die. And the guy, Mae was holding on to him for dear life. He wanted to get to the hospital, but he didn't want him to get away. And um, he held him for a long time until he couldn't hold him anymore. And that's when he ran him over. But he drove himself to the hospital. <laughs> he was back up in intensive care. This time, the last time he was in intensive care, it was from a beating with a bat. I forgot to mention that. Right after, less than a year after I lost my son, my best friend he dies in my house. And then another friend who I had gotten extremely close with and who now I am very, very close with. So, spoiler, he didn't die. That was God. But he got shot six times and only by the grace of God did he stay alive <clears throat> anyways I have been extremely long winded tonight but a lot of it's got to do with the time it's after midnight and I've heard myself get off point a couple of times and I know that I've dozed off almost my, I felt my eyes close, and <laughs> then after my eyes closed, I would hear myself say something off the wall that <laughs> had nothing to do with the part that I was supposed to be talking about. It's because I was falling asleep, and for that I truly apologize. I'm not used to staying up very late like this, and I'm definitely not used to doing three-hour live streams. But anyways, um, Maine, um, made it to the hospital. He drove, only thing he knew to do was drive back to the store that he picked the guy up from. So that's what he did. He drove back to the store. And they called 911. He got on an ambulance at the store. And he still did. <laughs> he said that he didn't feel better or allow himself to breathe easy until they got to the hospital. I wouldn't have been breathing easy even at the hospital. <laughs> Ugh. But nothing else. You were able to hear the majority of what happened throughout my life and after Michael died I mean uh, yeah after Michael died um, and then Maine almost died I changed see when I was a teenager who joined a gang, even though I shot that guy at 15 or 16, I didn't want to hurt him. And Lord knows if he would have lost his life, my life would have been over, even if I got away with it. But by the time we were adults and drug dealers <laughs> and after <clears throat> my son died then my best friend died and then my next best friend almost died I 
I changed. And I became a stone cold killer. I didn't care. So other than my children, my wife, I didn't care who lived and who died. I didn't care if a decision we made got somebody hurt. I put a crew together. I said, I said a few minutes ago that I had other right-hand men and people helping me after Maine. Well, it was actually while I was waiting on Maine to get out of the hospital that I put the crew together. <clears throat> and I went and recruited the most ruthless murder for hire stick up kid I recruited the wildest guy I knew and I made him my best friend I really didn't care anything about him. I didn't care if he lived or died. But I had become ruthless myself. I had become conniving. I had more money than I knew what to do with. <laughs> Don't anymore. Wish I'd have put some of it up. guy who I recruited to be my lieutenant, my right hand man. They called him Wild Bill because he was known for being a lunatic. <clears throat> he and I put together a crew and we sold more drugs than any other crew or anybody else in this area except for one guy. One guy named Juice Man. Juice Man was a multi-millionaire. Juice Man lived in a three-story brick house. Juice Man flaunted his wealth. <laughs> he thought that he was untouchable. The kid thought, Juice Man, this is why you're going to hear me tell you something I did to Juice Man in a minute, and I need to explain why. See, we always thought that Maine getting shot was a random robbery by a drug addict. But it wasn't. That random robbery that caused the guy to get run over and then go to prison for attempted murder got him paid $20,000 first because Juice Man hired him to kill someone that had been his very close friend since kindergarten all because Maine had the best drug hookup and because he was selling the most dope and so and juice man of course wanted his clients he wanted his profit he wanted everything so he hired the dope head to kill him to kill Maine only one problem the dope head decided to use a 22 revolver and while 22s are very deadly at close range he used a 22 with subsonic rounds to try to keep people from hearing it. He'd have been lucky to kill a squirrel at point blank range. Anyway. I made a lot of mistakes in between. The crew I put together 
main getting shot between Ben and um, the recovery. There was several years that went by, and so I um, made some moves myself without Maine, and I shouldn't have done that. I should have waited. But um. One of the things I did was I took a prescription. There was a guy whose dad was a doctor and he had stolen an entire prescription pad from his dad. And they were writing prescriptions and him and the girl that was doing it with him had pretty much filled 30 milligram oxycodone prescriptions at every pharmacy around. So, I went to get one filled for him. They get all these prescriptions filled. I take one up there. One. And the pharmacy tech realized it was a fake. But that's the thing, it wasn't a fake, it was a real prescription. With real everything. The thing was so real. Well, anyway, just forget about it. Maine started doing a whole lot better. After he did physical therapy. He actually enjoyed his physical therapy. I think it was because. He had a very pretty white, um, blonde haired, blue eyes physical therapist. And I don't, he may have had the same interest if he had been white, but he wasn't. He was a black guy. And today, he's my, well, not today because I haven't seen him in a little while. He's, a deacon in his church though but we're very close friends there was a time when we were just acquaintances but we're very close friends now I wasn't able to save Willie's life but I saved Maine's life a couple of times there's not enough time to break it all down but Before Maine got shot, he was the biggest drug dealer around. He had one guy that was competition, and he wasn't really competition because his territory was so far from Maine's territory, and there was enough people on drugs to supply for each of them to be able to supply plenty of all of their clients and that's what they did but When Maine got shot, Juice Man became the one on top. And all he wanted to do was stay on top. So he did everything he could do to do that. He had people murdered. People disappeared, never to be heard from again. Which one can only assume they were killed 
Juice Van was into witchcraft. He, I know he sacrificed quite a few people, but I will say this. The majority of the sacrifices that he and his followers, his crew did, or it was on Beltane. I don't know if you know what Beltane is. I didn't until this. But it was on Beltane and what we know as Halloween, which is really the Day of the Dead in Mexico and something almost exactly the same in Spain. But that's what I was talking about, how I would go to tell you guys something and I'm so tired, I start dozing off live on video, on the stream. I can't wait to watch this thing afterwards. Uh, of course, I'm going to fast forward, I'm going to watch it on the fast thing. But there's got to be parts in here that are hilarious with me falling asleep or not falling asleep but dozing and saying off the wall junk but anyway this is the bottom line of everything this is how the whole story came to a head and I said everything that I said tonight to get right here First, Juice Man gets locked up. But before Juice Man gets locked up, remember, Dodo here takes a forged prescription for 30 milligram Roxy's to the pharmacy. And they told me that if anything seemed off, to get the heck out of there and run. But I wasn't made to run. I really wasn't. So the way it happened was they accused me of it. And I just went. There is all kind of stuff on LinkedIn. all kinds but the uh, <laughs> the both the fiction and the non-fiction books that I wrote. What happened that made it all just go from bad to worse was Juice Man going to jail. I took that prescription and I, I ran. When I didn't run, I walked out the pharmacy and I saw my picture in the paper. They make these little lockup papers and it had my picture in it with a wanted thing. So I called the sheriff's department 
talk to the lead investigator and uh, I turn myself in. That almost cost me my life. But God's hand was in all of it. If I can stay awake long enough to tell you all of it, then you'll understand. But I got locked up sitting in the Holton cell and I see the doors open all these FBI DA whatever um, sled agents walk in there's probably eight or ten of them and who's walking in front of them Justin Jack Juice Man Jackson hmm. might not should have done that I didn't mean to but, anyhow, I found out from other people that were in there in the holding themselves with me that they had raided his house. And <laughs> those daggone drug cops, they don't mess around when they want somebody. They locked him up, his girlfriend up. They locked his mom up. They locked up the gardener who was outside cutting grass. <laughs> they took everybody to jail. And they found $1.5 million in the walls of that house. So... I called Wild Bill <laughs> said you're never gonna guess who just walked in the jailhouse with the federal agents and he's he told me who walked in he already knew and you know, our minds worked alike he said uh, I'm already working on it so I my wife bonded me out later that day, and that night we were breaking into a stash house because that's what he was doing was research, finding out where the stash houses were, and we found this house. It was a nice house in a nice neighborhood, but it had reinforced steel doors. Why would you have reinforced steel doors on the house and bars on all the windows unless there's something in there? So, and there was also like four bulldogs in the yard. But we, um, we went in there. It was very hard to get in the steel doors, but we did it. I did it. And some bolt cutters. We had to be fast. We actually went in there twice. The first time we only found substances and a gun. We left, went home. I kept saying, we need to go back. There's got to be more than that in there. If they found that much cash in his mother's house then he had to have cash at his stash house but the bill said trapped there's if we go back there then we're liable to die and I was too worried about money to think about dying right that second I should have listened but we went back anyway and we went back in Sure enough, there was a bedroom in the very back of the house. And in the bedroom, like the ceiling at the door, where the, the room, there was a hallway that went into the room. Uh, if you were in the bedroom, say you walked in the bedroom and you turned around and faced the door. Well, above the door, the ceiling, a hole had been cut in the ceiling and money had been thrown, stashed, in the hallway in the ceiling. And 
we were getting the money out of the ceiling when Justin's squad pulled up. <laughs> All I had on me was a 12 gauge shotgun pump. I don't even know why Bill had a gun. I think he did. But there was like five people in that Range Rover that pulled up at the house. And I just knew I was dead. I knew I was dead. There was bars on all the windows. So there was no jumping out a window. But I was able to get out of the front door because the way the driveway went led to the back. The way we went in was through the back. So I was able to get out of the front, but as I was running, <laughs> I had a duffel bag in one hand and a black 12-gauge pump in the other. And I'm running as fast as I can, and I had to run around the house to try to get to the truck, our truck, the truck that Bill and the guy that took us there because I wouldn't drive my vehicle there in case something like this happened. And neither would Bill, but... When I got around, they had already left. They left me. <laughs> they didn't go far, but they drove off without me. Anyways, I came out, and the guys were just getting out of the truck and going towards the house good. <laughs> and um, they saw me. And then it was like World War II. Except for in World War II or Three or whatever, each side has close to the same amount of people. It's not an army and one soldier. But that's what this was. It was just me and four or five of them. But I didn't even stop to shoot. I just ran. I just ran just as fast as I could. Ran until I saw some trees, ran in the woods. I could both hear and feel bullets whizzing by me. Now you got either four or five people shooting at you. Close range. They when I ran past them, if I would have ran like just a little bit closer, I could have reached out and touched one of them. And yeah, by the time I got to the woods, I was about 25 yards from them. But 25 yards isn't far when you're shooting at somebody. And I don't even know what all kind of guns they had, except for they were all pistols. But there was some kind of dirt road that went beside the woods I don't know how far it went but I stayed in the trees because I didn't want to get shot and eventually they lost interest in me and wanted to go in the house because of whatever was in there the first time we went to the house we found about an ounce of something you may not know what it is or you may do know what it is but it was something called Molly Something that I've never done before. I didn't do it then. <clears throat> and then there was uh, about a pound of marijuana. That's all the drugs that we found. And like 16 grand in ones, fives, tens small bills but I finally found like they had stopped and turned around and came back for me Bill and I can't remember the guy whose name that drove us there he had dreadlocks I remember that but I can't remember his name but anyway they picked me up and I was in about as bad of shape as I am now I was not in shape definitely couldn't run but I was running for dear life 
Anyway, that is the final time that I was in any kind of physical, especially firearm, altercation. No, it's not. I was in one more before things changed. But the other one was 100% self-defense. And it was even legal. The cops justified it. So we're not even going to talk about that one because it's got nothing to do with the lifestyle or anything. But besides that, um, I, um, before I knew it, I was doing drugs pretty hard and heavy. I couldn't stand the pain I was in mental anguish like I had never felt in my life and I know now that it was from holding in the tears and the mourning and everything else from my son and everybody Willie my best friend the closest thing I did to mourning Michael was the tattoo that I got with him at the tattoo party I went and added to it instead of just the Grim Reaper in chains I got R.I.P. Willie <laughs> that's not much mourning I should have been mourning I didn't mourn my son at all and so I had all that held inside me and it festered and festered until I was as cold hearted as I was when, uh, like when we were at that house five people pull up with guns fight or flight kicks in and you're gonna run but if it had been one person I'd have shot him and left him there I wouldn't have thought twice about it and that scares me so bad but at the same time it it's a faith builder like you wouldn't believe because I know that there's no way in the world that I would even dream of doing that now and the only weapon I use is for the war that I'm in and that is my Draco I've got a Draco right here and my Draco ain't no joke. So, I just wish that I would have been in the same place then, but I wasn't. But, this is the longest testimony I've ever given. But I am closing it out for today. I'm going to have to do a part two. Got to. Too much to tell. See, I've always given my testimony in just like a brief overview. I have never given a detailed testimony like I did tonight. But I really felt led to. I just didn't mean to go to sleep. And I didn't go to sleep. I just dozed off a little bit. But it, was, it is. I'm trying to look on my phone. But it's mad at me. Because see, it's one in the morning. That's why I was dozing off. But listen to this. Wait a minute. Thing says has low volume. Why does it have low volume? Better not have low volume. Hello? Sorry, guys. I ain't Why does this thing say it has low volume? Hmm. All right. Well, you said it sounds fine. So I'm gonna take your word for it. But this is what happened. I, because of all the things I did in my life, the drugs I was doing went from pills 
to harder and harder substances. Before I knew it, I was snorting heroin and cocaine. And then it didn't take very long. And we're talking about my own product here. And, you know, it's one of the biggest rules in the game is you do not get high on your own supply. I mean, that might sound like a cliche and sound funny, but it is the truth. It is 100% impossible to remain in the game if you are using your own product. Sorry, my cross was stuck in my shirt. But I started. And it's because I wanted to be numb. I wanted to be numb all the time. I didn't want to feel anything. And that snorting changed to, I remember this was back when I still celebrated Christmas. We were at my parents in Charleston, and my dad's a diabetic. And he had a bunch of insulin syringes. Well, I grabbed a bunch of them. And I remember the first time that I shot up. I was at one of, he was actually my biggest customer and one of my best friends. And I had been doing the heroin and the opiate pain medicine so for long enough that when I didn't have it, I would get really sick, withdrawal sick. And I was in withdrawals this time. But I had, uh, I had just got a brand new hookup. He was from South Africa or somewhere, I don't know. He was a black guy, but he had a very strong African accent. And he told me what country he was from, but I can't remember. See, I hope nobody's getting offended, but almost all of my friends and everyone that you've heard me say was like my brother was black it, it, it was just like the inside joke I was the only white guy in our clique our group of friends <laughs> people picked on me because I was the only white guy not like really picked but joking around but it's because I grew up in that neighborhood I it's the people I lived around and so, I mean, when you grow up and live in a neighborhood, you know, on a street or a block, then it, it really makes no difference if you're black, white, brown, you know, whatever. And it's probably hard to tell with how messed up this camera is, but I'm more brown than I am white anyway because of the Native American in me. My grandfather, my dad's dad, was full-blooded, 100% Cherokee. So I guess that would make my dad 50%. I don't know what the heck it would make me, but it makes it to where I can't go out in the sun without <laughs> almost turning black. But regardless, um, I um, got more and more strung out. Brad, who was my best friend, begged me not to use that needle. But I had sold cocaine and crack for so long. And I had seen women sell their babies clothes and toys to get a crack rock to smoke it. And I wasn't smoking crack. I wasn't going to do it. And I had been snorting cocaine the whole time. I mean, there was it was just a recreational thing. There was nothing to it for me. So I figured since I had been snorting coke the whole time and it wasn't doing anything to me, like as far as hurting me, I figured what's the difference in that and shooting a little bit up. Well, that was... That was one of the biggest mistakes in my life. Well, so I thought, but God had a plan. So I shot cocaine up for the first time. 
It felt so good I started crying. No lie. Not like bawling, but I started crying. I got emotional. And I don't know if you guys remember, but I I told you that you know, ever since my son died, my best friend died, I couldn't get emotional. I couldn't. And here I shot the cocaine up and it was like instant emotion. And then I shot some heroin up afterwards to come down. Well, thought it was heroin. It was the, from the guy with the accent. It was solid white and it didn't look like heroin. And I tasted it like I always do. And instead of being bitter, like heroin is, it numbed my mouth like completely like cocaine does. So I thought it was cocaine because usually if I buy a bundle of heroin it, it comes in pre-packaged sealed um, slips. But this guy was like a big, big time dealer and like I said he was from South Africa. But he was selling it straight out of a bag, like a, a baggie like you'll see marijuana in. And he had, oh my goodness, it was almost more than I've ever bought at one time. And he sold it to me for like $100. This guy had to be huge big time. But anyways, I tasted it, and I didn't care how big he was. I told him that it was not heroin, that it was cocaine, and that I had that. I didn't want that. And he told me that I didn't know what I was talking about, and he asked me if I had anything to do it with. I told him, yeah, I had my works, and he told me to do some. He said, try some. If it doesn't do what you want it to do, you can have the whole bag for free. So I tried it. And that, along with the cocaine that I had done a little while earlier that day, was the worst mistake drug-wise that I've ever done because what that was, that white powder, I thought it was like China White or pure Afghani or something like that. But what it was, was pure fentanyl. And it could have and should have killed me because I didn't know what it was and I used it like it was H. But it didn't kill me. I did all of it eventually and before I knew it, I was no longer selling anything except for the pain medicine that I got from the doctor and I only sold that to have money to buy cocaine anyhow I got extremely strung out so strung out that almost, all, I did lose my job once because I had been up for a couple of days and I passed out in the porta potty and then I was at my grandmother's and my daughter walked in the bathroom and I had passed out in there and there was a spoon and a needle and cotton and half of a water bottle sitting right there on the bathroom counter. And of course my daughter lost it, went nuts. She had every right to, but so then my daughter knew that her dad, I mean, she knew that I was a drug dealer. It was no secret. The whole family knew that I sold drugs. But nobody but my wife knew that I was strung out on. And in a week's time, everybody knew. And then we fast forward to 2016 and I have ruined all of my veins. I used to have 
huge veins all in my arms. I lifted weights. But I had no more veins in my hands, my arms. I had scars everywhere on the back of my arms, the side of my arms, the inside of my arms. I still got scars on the inside of my arms, but right there where you're supposed to have big veins, and I did have huge veins, they were all gone. Both arms, veins in my legs, my feet, all gone. None of them worked anymore. The only way I could shoot up was to get in the mirror and strain like I was taking a dump until my jugular veins popped out. Like right here on the side, I've got a tattoo that says Trap Star, which is a joke. But it, I'm glad I still have it, although I hate tattoos. But I'm still a Trap Star, but just like Jesus made the apostles fishers of men instead of getting people trapped on drugs I'm trapping for Christ anyway um, I would stand in the mirror and strain until my veins popped out my jugular veins and I would shoot up in my neck and my jugular veins and eventually my jugular veins we're talking veins the size of my finger they quit working that is that's so dangerous I'm not even going to talk about it because it'll make me anxious and I'm liable to start having a panic attack because they never came back um, slowly little surface veins started coming back in my arms and in my hands but I never got my veins back back never and it's been it's been years and years and years since I've uh, used a needle or gotten high like that but because all my veins quit working you know I got really depressed and one time um, this was like the end of almost the end of the road uh, a friend of mine uh, from the Navy um, somebody that I, I went to school with he and I um, drove to I think, we drove, I think it was North Carolina. I don't know. We drove somewhere to pick a girl up for him. And, and we came back. And I went to my supplier's house. Who after all this time, even though I had been getting high for two years. And using a needle to get high for over a year. He had no idea. He still thought I was selling weight even though I would never buy weight I don't, I don't maybe he didn't know maybe he didn't know the truth and just didn't want he let me believe that he didn't but anyways um, we went up there and I bought $20 worth or maybe $40 worth and I bought I didn't buy anything I asked him for a big bag of isotol cut and he asked me why, and I don't remember what I told him. But the reason I wanted it was because I was going to sprinkle just a little bit of the cocaine I bought into it, enough to make it smell and taste like cocaine, and I was going to sell it and rip somebody off. And anyway, but when we got to Florence, they could see the gas gauge didn't work in the car. And it was a fairly new car because the other one, the engine blew up in it. And when that happened, um, we got out and we were, um, getting ready to go to some the girl was staying at a friend's house they were like really a lot older than her it was a man and a woman anyways I dropped her off there and I was almost out of gas so I parked in this parking lot I backed into the parking lot we had we still had nice vehicles we had an SUV 
and I had a 2017 Cadillac CTS with a V8 engine. Um, it had a Bose stereo system with two Bose 12 inch subwoofers in the trunk and the car was awesome. It was it was close to a hundred thousand dollar car with everything on it. I don't know how much it would be factory. But I don't even know if Cadillac makes the CTS or the STS anymore. But On the one hand, I didn't want to leave the guy in my car, whether it's on the side of the road or if I was able to drive it to the house. But on the other hand, I was kind of worried about them coming to the house. So I didn't know what to do. So eventually we went. Brad, my best friend, he uh, picked up, or I took him to pick up, the girl he was seeing, and we came back here to my house. And I left him here, and then I drove to that parking lot where I told you I ran out of gas. And I was stuck in the parking lot, and the car, it didn't have a key. It had a button. You just push the button, and it would crank up. Well, I tried and tried to crank it, and it would. It was either completely out of gas or something. I got a little bit of gas and put it in there. And then I got in the car and I sat down. I laid the seat all the way back. I locked the doors. I cracked the sunroof. I laid the seat back. I went to sleep. I went completely to sleep. And then I woke up, and however long later, across the road, the car face up in a big canal ditch. Somehow, in my sleep, I cranked the car up and jumped the four-lane highway into the ditch. That, or these demons from the drugs picked the car up and threw it across the road but I think it was the first option. Anyhow, I woke up to the police pulling me out of the car. <laughs> and I had syringes in my pocket. <laughs> I had Brad's prescription. I had that whole bag of Isotol that I had gotten from a man and I also had the other stuff that he had asked me to get and so I was in a lot of trouble they took me to jail the car we had just bought the car the car was pretty much brand new still had the paper tag on I, um, I went to jail. I was in there for over a month. While I was in there, I prayed. I fasted more than anything. Not because I was super righteous, but because the food was horrible. I mean, it was worse than prison food. Prison food was pretty good. But county jail food was terrible. Anyway, I prayed and I 
promised. And I'm sure God has heard all the promises that I gave. Many times. And after it got to be about two months, well, no, not quite two months, a little over a month, my prayers changed, my promises changed, and I surrendered to just being in there. <laughs> and it was crazy. The very day that I surrendered myself to the fact that I was going to be there, I got called to the front. And, of course, I, I had had a bond set when I first got there. But after being there so long, they let me go on my own personal recognizance, a PR bond. I didn't even know I was getting out. I had to call my daughter to come and pick me up. And it took her almost two hours to get to me. And I wasn't going to stay at the jail for them to change their mind and lock me back up. So I started walking. Anyway, I got home. I stayed clean off the drugs for a couple months. My brother, or my best friend, he's not really my brother, but I call him my brother, Brad. He needed help. He needed somewhere to stay. So like always, I let him come live with me. I swore that I had been through too much. He was not going to influence me no matter what. I was wrong. He did influence me. And it wasn't a very long before he was back with the woman that was nothing but trouble. and She had no business at my house. My wife and my children were staying with my daughter, I say my children, my youngest son. But, well, both my sons, my wife and my boys, were staying with my daughter. And they stayed there with her while I got the house straight. And while they were there, I checked on the getting home thing. And it, I don't know if it was some kind of Halloween scare or if it was real, but it said that the only way out was through and like through the whatever the problem and you had to go through them and just wasn't worth it to me to know that we had the thing on yours to use but anyways I um kept trying to do the CPR and it wasn't working no matter what I did it wasn't working And I asked to speak with Joe in case the problem was with Chad. But it still wasn't working. <laughs> and I had all of the stuff that I bought in my pocket. And I had the bag with the syringes. And when we got to my house, this house that we're in right now, I told them that they could have my room for the night. And... that I was going to stay in the living room. And I still had the bag of cocaine. 
I still had my needle, my spoon, my cotton, my water, but I had never done anything with it. I hadn't even broke it down. I say water, it was vinegar because I didn't have powder cocaine this time. I had crack. I was going to shoot up crack. And the water was why I couldn't when it all boils down to it. But I had the stuff there and I was ready to do it and I knew one of two things was going to happen. I have never had like a really strong supernatural worldview before this happened. Like I had, I had read some books. I owned a Derek Prince book and I had seen some videos and heard a podcast episode or two and I knew some scriptures but <laughs> it really didn't prepare for any of it. It didn't prepare me for any of it. But anyway, I uh, I did it. I sat there contemplating whether I was going to get high or surrender. I knew one of two things was happening that night. I was ready to die, honestly. I had enough dope to die. I was either going to shoot up every bit of the dope I had, along with some pills that are able to be shot up. I was going to do as much as I could possibly do for it. To do what I wanted it to do. Well, the reason I wanted it to do that is because I literally had demons manifesting. Not in me. I was seeing them. Now you could say, oh, man, you were just seeing stuff. You were hallucinating. Well, if I was hallucinating, why would I be hallucinating? I hadn't done any acid or <laughs> any peyote or any mushrooms. I hadn't done anything any cocaine, so I hadn't been awake for days, I hadn't even been awake, you know, it, it, it wasn't even all night yet, it was like 7 o'clock at night, and I slept fine the night before, <laughs> this night, however, I was ready to die. I didn't necessarily want to die. There's a difference in wanting to die and being ready to die. And that night I was ready to die. Now, the sad, sad thing is my heart was not ready to die. And if I had died, it would have been bad. <laughs> because I was not right with God. I was not a disciple of his son. I sat there. I was sitting in my recliner in the living room. Beside the recliner, there was a little coffee table. I had the works on the coffee table.
I was to the point where one of two things was going to happen. I was either going to kill myself with the shot or Jesus was going to save me. And I even got the bag. I started untying the bag. And as I was untying that bag, I got butterflies in my stomach and I was thinking, oh, now I'm just nervous because I'm about to be doing this. That wasn't it. that but I know that <laughs> it's dark and hell is hot and I don't want to go so what I did was <laughs> I cried out as loud as I could to Jesus I just I was literally seeing shadow figures and I was hearing voices telling me to do it. <laughs> but then I it was like, it wasn't even me. It was like something or somebody else took over my vocal cords, my voice. And when that happened, I cried out. I mean, cried out loud. Jesus, please save me. I'll never forget it. It was like a dam broke inside of me. I cried so many tears. <laughs> you just don't know. <laughs> he gave me a different mind. A different heart. Different desires. Different wants. so grateful so grateful mm. I um Just I can't believe that Jesus would love someone like me enough to die a horrible, horrible death. Bye.
Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners and enemies, enemies for the gospel's sake, Christ died for us. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now, Lord, and I thank you so much for allowing me to share my testimony tonight. I pray that, that all those who need to hear it will hear it. I pray that you will make sure that anyone who is struggling the way that I was struggling will be able to hear what you did in my life. And take comfort. I know that you. King of kings and the Lord of lords. I love you so much, Jesus. And I thank you so much. Father, I pray and ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Guys, I appreciate you listening to this extremely long testimony. I'm going to take it down and edit it to make it a little shorter and to take out any parts that are arguing. Father, I pray that you would just bring everyone back at the appointed time. I pray that you would just bless each and every person who is in the sound of my voice. And I ask all these things, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Thank you, guys. Until next time, for Kingdom Productions and Publishing and the Remnant Report, this is Pastor Jeremy Anderson, a.k.a. the Remnant Warrior, saying good night, or actually in this case, <laughs> good morning, and God bless.